The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat peer to peer. Oh, buddy. Oh, buddy. Hey, what's up, guys? Hey. Happy New Year's. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year man. Let's see. Let me get me sharing on this screen. So, uh, unfortunately, I think this price report might be a little bit <clears throat> might be a little bit anticlimactic. <laughs> ah. I um, okay. I got some some uh, Christmas toys and I was putting them in my my main PC or not really PC, but you know, um, computer. And uh, my power supply went out, so uh, that took me all of two days ago to figure out or figure out and replace. Um, and then now my CPU is overheating because I'm pretty sure moving my case around got air bubbles in my little um, hybrid all-in-one cooler, so it's making like gurgling noises. Uh, so. I'm on a I'm on a borrowed laptop here, so hopefully. Oh, wow. Power supply makes some magic smoke. No, it didn't do anything. It just like silently died. <laughs> I was Sad. like, man, did I like short something on the motherboard? Has dust finally murdered my uh, my case here? <laughs> um, yeah, but no, I finally did the pen test. Apparently, you connect two pens together, and it should start the fan, and it didn't do that. So that was a good indication that uh, that yeah, the power supply was gone. So, anyways. What's up? Unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things. It's like uh, I have to open my case and reconfigure things to connect this stuff, and you just like you just know the chances of something going wrong <laughs> when you have a steady state system. Like you just never want to touch it. Like you do servers, so you know. Like if it's working and it's complex, just like don't touch it. Like handle it delicately. Like maybe don't even restart it. Like update it in place if you can. Like that's yeah, just my server is a pain in the ass to restart. Yep. I totally understand. Come on, yeah. guys. Donate to body. Get this man a new power supply for his computer. <laughs> no, I, got, I, I bought it. I, I went, I actually found a store finally in Mexico that like sells this stuff. They, they, in oh, Mexico, cool. everything is like shipped. You buy it and they ship it to you. And it's hard to find sometimes stores that have like specialty items. I mean, to be honest, that's like, that's a lot of, a lot of the ways things are going here too now. Like, I mean, most PC stuff you have to buy online now, unless you have a micro center near you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> we may or may not have a micro center nearby, <laughs> or a or a fries. Is fries still a thing? Did they no, they're out of business. business. They died. Oh, Man, they yeah. were the best. What's yeah, they're all fries? going away. Yeah. Never heard of fries. Yeah, I don't think that was a New York thing. Micro center we have. Yeah. Yes, lucky. I'm jealous. Okay, so I think I'm sharing my screen now. Y'all tell me. So, buddy, buddy this Hold it up, is but there's nothing hell of, a, there. hell of a way to end the year, though, right? I feel like, um, you know, with, with the with the delisting. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Like, finally, thanks, guys. I'm not sure how much, I'm not sure how much Binance matters anymore when it comes to Monero. I think we got the word out. I think most people got off of Binance. I think they're still used in like fixed float, um, Changely, and a bunch of these other. Um, a bunch of these other like they're not decentralized but uh accountless exchanges so maybe like the liquidity there is still kind of important for those kinds of trades definitely it's going to be a liquidity hit but man I'll, I'll take the lower liquidity and and see how we do on our own with price i'm not so after we found out after howard chu showed us that they were using uh, monero miners and probably at a loss given given how like inefficient those miners were i now really question whether or not did they finally get enough Monero to cover their books? Um, did they spend some amount of time like basically covering those shorts? I think that's possible. I'm not sure that we should expect any massive price pumps. And if anything, remember the last time that the Cabal tried to um, tried to like do a plan delisting of uh, of Monero off Bitrex, even though there was like no volume on Bitrex. Um, remember like price, everything just like relatively tanked. Our price relatively tanked. The charts didn't make any sense. Um, don't be surprised if they delist Monero and it's not confirmed. I don't think we've like heard an official word from Binance. They have been like delisting in some, you know, countries here and there. Um, but if like they totally delist Monero, don't be surprised if the cabal still finds a way to sell Monero and, and take the price. Like, don't be surprised if they saved up a little stash to try and like push the price in the direction of the narratives they want to create. So this might be like some short term pain. I'm not saying that's necessarily the case, but like it might be. So um, just like just be prepared for that, guys. If you know, if if we get that final delisting move, like the cabal loves to move price in the direction of the narratives that they're you know that they're promulgating. So um, 
but overall, I mean, this is a good thing. Like is, is holding your coin on Binance. Is that really adoption? No. So I think ultimately yeah, this ends yeah, up being yeah, a good thing. overall it's, it's what we've all been waiting for, right? Anybody who's been in Monero for, for the legitimate reasons knows that this was kind of the, the direction things were headed and the way we ultimately, we want things to go, but there might be some growing, growing pains that go along with it. Right. As we transition. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll really have to get more liquidity onto the different DEXs. BISC already has pretty solid liquidity, although I haven't checked it out in a while. I need to just reinstall it. I just deleted it years ago because I'm like, well, I'm in Monero now. I don't need Bitcoin. Occasionally, I unfortunately still do need Bitcoin. But um, <laughs> yeah, but I will you say know, like, like things that come to mind, right? Like you said, like the inst like there are instant exchanges that I think rely on Binance. But, you know, even uh, I've been talking on the show how we... You, you can go down to Buenos Aires, right? And you can go into these cuevas and you could exchange US dollar bills for pesos. You could also exchange crypto for pesos. All those cuevas use Binance is my understanding, right? Oh, so interesting. like even that right there. Now, does that mean you can no longer swap your Monero into pesos down in Argentina? No, I guess you'd have to, you know, use another, you know, exchange your your monero into another crypto and then exchange it out of cueva but it's just like those there is going to be added friction there in, in in places where it's going to effectively be harder to on ramp and off ramp i mean that's obviously it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna come with the the delisting yeah um that's that's definitely that's definitely true there was a guy i can't remember his name on twitter but um he was arguing that lower liquidity is a bad thing and i tend to agree like I kind of debated with him a little bit um, that it's not always necessarily a bad thing. But in this case, like lower liquidity is going to make it, like you said, more friction to um, to use Monero to get in and out of it because, you know, it's not really a popularly accepted currency, even among cryptocurrencies. So it still requires us, uh, unfortunately, to swap um, somewhat often. Um, you know, looking into 2024, maybe there's an opportunity there um, with Malay and Argentina. Um I mean, I, I've said, hey, I, I've been thinking about moving down there ever since he got elected, but, you know, I really want to see him follow through. And so far, like what we've seen is follow through. We've seen him doing things that I've never seen a politician anywhere ever do or reported to have done in history. So this is pretty good. Like, this is a good sign. I want to see it continue to follow through. But there might be an opportunity with the Cuevas and um, liquidity and crypto and, and just going down there and starting a business um, between dollars and crypto. For sure. For sure. Yeah, we did. Uh, we did uh, actually, I had so I had this guy on last night. His name is Nate. I don't know his last name. He's what is his name? Token Dynamics or something? His, yeah, Token Dynamics. To Token Dynamics. Maybe he's the guy you were talking about on on Twitter. Because yeah, he's he. I had him on, and we, we obviously the whole show was basically about the Binance delisting. So we'll be posting oh. a couple of, a couple of days and. His overall take is initially there is going to be a lot more volatility. He's thinking after mm -hmm. the delisting um, because of the drop in liquidity, there'll be more volatility. Uh, he thinks there's going to be, you know, like a, a drop in, in price, I guess a scare or whatever. But then ultimately he sees, uh, you know, Monero, Monero rising because of it, uh, you know, well, because of this theory that there's paper Monero that was being, uh, you know, issued on Binance and that will no longer be the case. And, once once Binance is gone, all we really have in terms of centralized exchanges, major ones, is Kraken. And there is this thinking that Kraken, you know, isn't participating in, in printing paper Monero because of who they are and the people that have you know that are behind Kraken, Jesse Powell. I mean, obviously we don't know, but that that's that's the thinking. I don't know, buddy, what, what do you think of that overall assessment? I would very much like to believe that Kraken is um, is honest here. It was kind of weird the other night, or sorry, the other couple weeks ago when um, you know when they didn't really respond to us, and they, uh, well, I can't remember their exact phrasing on it, but it it sounded like they were telling the truth, but in a way to avoid saying more of the truth. Um, I think the lower, yeah, the lower liquidity. So definitely, low liquidity implies the potential for heavy volatility. Um, you know, really what we want is upside volatility. We want high buy side liquidity and low sell side liquidity. Um, but who knows like what that's really going to look like. There's still going to be demand from darknets. There's a significant amount of infrastructure that's been built out over the past couple of years. Um, 
I do think that, yeah, his, his assessment that uh, a price drop really could be in the cards. I'm, I'm not super confident that, um, I'm not sure whether or not Binance has covered for their, um, for their fractional reserve. They might have because again, because of those Monero miners, if they have covered that, then we shouldn't expect like significant price pumps anywhere in the near future. But if they like, if they have to close all of that out and wind it down, then probably we should expect to see Monero um, pumping significantly. Maybe, maybe an initial crash where they'll try and like crash the price. They'll try and like make everything terrible, you know, get the news out, whatever, um, buy up as much Monero as they can so they can cover their books. Like that might be a strategy that they're going for. And in fact, if they're fractional reserved at all, unless they're hundred percent reserved now, probably that's going to be the play. That's probably what they're going to do. They're going to like put the news story out there, hit the price, um, and then try and try and scoop up some Monero. They'll be limited in how much they can do that. Uh, in terms like, cause if they want to really hit the price, they're going to have to coordinate somehow. Um, Kraken is probably the least bad player out there. I hesitate to say that they're good, but I mean, I think they should be pretty good. Jesse Powell, uh, really has me convinced. Like he seems like a good guy. So, yeah, um, I mean, nice. I think his, I, th I think that analysis is pretty, pretty close, um, you know, to probably what will happen. But we don't know if he's even really calling the shots over there anymore, right? So who knows? Who knows what's happening? Yeah, but yeah, exactly. And they're getting sued by the government now, so who knows what kind of like deals they might have to cut there to to stay alive, right? So, but ultimately, you it would seem that there would ultimately be kind of a premium for for Monero, right? So it's if it's going to be delisted from all centralized exchanges, but yet there's this strong organic demand for it for purposes of digital cash, right? Anybody who wants to go on a the dark market or whatever or whatever it is anybody who like truly needs digital cash uh is gonna have to go and obtain it and because of the added friction and less liquidity i would think there'd be kind of a premium in price just like we see with uh local monero right um there's there's a yep. premium there versus what you see on centralized exchanges yeah um i, th I mean i think there's definitely a lot to that that uh i mean there we we have organic demand for particular use cases at a minimum, right? We have organic demand for, for certain use cases. So that demand, like, especially in dark nets, like no one's going to, no one's going to be like, Oh, I'll just go use Bitcoin now. Like anyone that's been using Monero, isn't just going to be like, well, it's too hard to get on the, like, we're going to find those people are going to find other ways. And that demand is going to persist. And um, like, ultimately that's, that's what keeps us going. Like that's, I think that's why Monero is still here is because we really do have organic demand and usage. Exactly. And those other ways of getting it are just going to get easier and easier to the point where it's almost going to be indistinguishable from centralized exchanges, I think. Yeah. You know, and then too, like, unless you're, okay, so for the people out there that need to buy a million at a time, $100,000, $200,000 at a time, it might be a little bit, it's going to be harder for you. But if you're just buying a thousand here, you know, 5,000 there, whatever, you can use local Monero without a problem. Like you can, you can get on there and, and make that trade. Um, and there's, there's plenty of places to do that. You can get it like cash, you can get it to your bank account. Like there's, there's, there's still going to be ways of finding that liquidity. And oh, by the way, you can just, you could still just buy Bitcoin or buy Litecoin or whatever, and then swap that on an instant exchange somewhere. Um, or you could buy Ethereum and test out those atomic swaps. Dang, I would yeah. say, I'd say Bitcoin, but I don't know. You got to compete with wizards now. <laughs> transaction fees too high yeah I, I redid my screen sharing have y'all is that uh can y'all see that yeah yep we got it. oh okay right on looks like it's there so um let's see uh unfortunately i don't have too much prepared but also nothing that exciting has happened uh why don't we start with the stock market i guess because um, that's the most exciting thing that has happened in the past week or so uh basically stock market nasdaq so tech stocks this was the previous all-time high that was set back at the top 2021 uh, November. And then finally, the NASDAQ has beaten that, right? It's gotten above. You couldn't say the same for Bitcoin, right? You can't say that Bitcoin is back at its all-time highs and has beaten its all-time highs. So at the moment, I mean, the NASDAQ is still outperforming Bitcoin. And this is like, this is a trend that tends to happen where it's like, um, if we looked at, maybe we can even pull up the, the chart, crypto versus stocks. Um, it's it's been hard for Bitcoin to actually beat the Nasdaq, except for um, big liquidity pumps. So, you know, I think that's on purpose. I think that's um, 
that's not like unreasonable considering the way that price is managed. So right here, this was 2017. That was the 2017 peak. And Bitcoin is still not above its 2017 peak in terms of the NASDAQ. So like if you had bought Bitcoin at the peak in 2017, you would have basically been better off having bought the NASDAQ unless you were smart enough to sell the top here. Um, you know, at some point, like another big liquidity run is going to happen. And, you know, Bitcoin's probably going to beat this other all time high. Um, I don't think I've done any kind of regression analysis on the Bitcoin, Bitcoin versus the NASDAQ. But, you know, I really should. Um, I've got scripts set up so I can just like kind of automatically do this pretty quickly. Um, but there's just so many things to do, right? How am I going to do them all? Um, maybe I can just like send those scripts to other people, um, publish them on GitHub and let other people play with them and see what they can come up with. Um, okay. So anyways, yeah, the NASDAQ has gotten above its all time highs. It's now kind of popped above. Um, we talked about this a few weeks ago where it's like really to, to feel like bullish. If you really want like that bullish feel in the NASDAQ, you don't just want to hit the all time high. You want to beat it before you uh, maybe make some kind of pullback here. Um, you'll notice that this channel, um, we had talked about this channel since really last year. Like this channel has been a year long channel that's been relevant for us. Um, let's mute the liquidity for a second. Um, that channel has been relevant for us for price for a while, kind of popped above it here. We're now above it again. And um, I'm really like, I'm probably just going to be looking at this channel uh, in, a, in a continuous fashion here for the rest of next year as well. Um, yes, price will probably be above it, but I, I don't expect it to just parabolically go above that channel. Um, right now, so I've been kind of thinking something. I'm, I'm not really confident that this market pump is actually a good thing. Uh, I'm not sure that it really spells good news for the markets. Like if everything was fine and the economy was fine and, and there wasn't like really any major problems in the international stage and, and the dollar was good and strong and, and the U.S. was strong and the bonds were strong, yada, yada. Why, what, what would be the need to pump the market like this? Why would you need to, to create this like, right, to create this situation where the market is just pumping, pumping, pump, pumping back to new all-time highs? Is it because inflation is so bad, like people, like they need to manage people's expectations so that people don't feel like they're like going broke with inflation? Um, are they trying to outcompete gold? So gold is is currently, um, gold is currently pushing up against its all-time highs. Um, a, a story that I, I guess I hadn't heard of, probably because it wasn't reported anywhere, China, so China had four banks with the LBMA, which is the London Bullion Market Association. The LBMA was allegedly created um, to sort of uh, overcome the manipulation of, um, oh, I can't remember. There was like another major like international gold um, exchange uh, or market. Anyways, so China had four banks that had joined the LBMA in like 2015, 2016. And those four banks quietly withdrew completely from the LBMA. They're not on their list anymore. At least that's what's being reported quietly by a few different um, sources. Uh, but it was completely unreported by the LBMA or by mainstream media at all. So Shanghai and um, and I believe Beijing, but maybe it's just Shanghai. They have their own gold, like international gold exchange now. This is one of the ways they're facilitating their own cross-border payments and gold settlements with Russia for oil and other different countries. And I believe recently, as of the past month or so, the first gold settlement was accomplished by China, like to for some kind of trade balance. So um, you know, it does seem like there might be something to this story that um, that the the world is de-dollarizing. I think it's more like a slow motion train wreck, or at least it has been for the past, let's just say, few years, maybe let's just say three, five, six years, something like that. Um, banks still use U.S. dollars in their in their central banks as reserves, but um, you know they are they are definitely, especially the big countries like China, Russia, they do seem to be trying to do trade in things apart from the dollar. But that transition is slow. Um, my guess is they don't want to massively disrupt the economy because the econ like the international economy is so integrated. Like China sells so much of their stuff to the United States. They don't want to just crash the United States and crash the demand, crash the dollar, because you know, then they lose uh, a trading partner and they lose a lot of revenue. So it does seem to make sense to me that we are seeing um a transition here away from the dollar, but it's slow. I think it's a it's a lot slower than people would probably prefer. So, anyways, that's a little bit of a side rant about gold. Um, next year I do think. Gold has reasonably good chances to perform well. <laughs> I'm a broken record on that one, I guess. I've been saying that since uh, really since last year. Um, but okay, right? Gold kind of finished last year down here, and uh, it's it's you know it's done good for gold. It, the point of gold is to be stable, to be money, and you don't really like you don't really want your money to be uh, heavily volatile and like oscillating massively. 
So, uh, but also you want your money to have a fair and honest price, which I don't think gold does. So um, when that happens, you get this volatility occasionally where it's going to just pump to the upside. So um, the way this chart structure looks, you would think, oh, well, you could go the entire year of 2024, just kind of oscillating in this range here. And maybe, right? Maybe. But given this wick that happened above here, set a new all-time high, given that we've had now multiple weekly closes, in fact, we could take a look at the monthly here. Um, gold is now about to close this month. So last month and this month above, um, or at least at the previous all-time highs. So um, I guess this is actually the monthly close here because uh, the market closed yesterday. So um, yeah, I mean, obviously this is this is a bullish chart, right? You look at this, you, you definitely would conclude this is a bullish chart. Maybe we could take a look at the yearly because, you know, it's the end of the year. So, um, yeah, I mean, looking looking good on the annual chart, right? We're closing another year higher uh, than gold has ever closed before. Um, last previous uh, annual close was um, 2020. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of a kind of a little rant there on gold for you for the new year. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at bonds, 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 because some weird things are happening with bonds. We've, we've seen this drop off here. So this means that bond prices are increasing, right? Uh, the yields are dropping, uh, which means that uh, the value of older bonds is now worth more, right? The bonds bought here have a higher value than bonds issued here. So um, we're seeing this thing again where the federal funds rate, we are now seeing the short-term yield. I think that's the three-month. Uh, nope, sorry, six-month. We're now seeing the six-month yield just ever so slightly below the federal funds uh, rate. And remember, we talked about this. Once we see all of these yields below this federal funds rate and moving down, if we see like that curving down, that's that's really a warning sign, especially if the yield curve inversion does that. So um, there is a, totally a possibility that that happens in 2019 and 2020 before the um, the whole pre-planned medical nonsense uh, it wasn't really medical. It was really just government nonsense. Um they pumped the markets like the markets probably shouldn't have pumped. They pumped them like parabolically uh, out of trend. And so if we continue to see the Nasdaq pumping parabolically out of trend and then these bonds doing this, eh, we're, we're going to have to really watch our backs for the possibility of some like big crash event um, that could be that could be happening. Um, it's, it's not here yet, but um, we are seeing slowly. Like a like a slow moving train wreck happening in front of us, but potentially, <laughs> like I said, I'm, I'm using a colorful language here, but maybe they figured some stuff out and they're they're just going to continue pumping the markets and we're not going to have a pullback. That happens, right? That happened from from twenty from 2009 all the way to like 2019 or 2018, and even the 2018 was only a 20 percent or 15 percent pullback, and then things just continued to go up. Like we didn't get any anything beyond 20 percent until um, until March of 2020. So that's, that's longer than a decade, right? That is an entire decade of just number go up. So, uh, I guess, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll just have to see if the signs turn that direction, you know, we'll keep you updated here weekly on the price report, hopefully in enough time for people to take, um, evasive actions. Um, let's take a look at Monero. So uh, yeah, we, I don't I don't think this is fair. We had this like big big red candle, probably. Um, I mean, who knows? Probably, maybe this is partially related to the news of a Binance delisting. Um, and again, probably, maybe that's just the cabal like trying to make the candle seem what the news is saying, right? Although I think the news came out on Thursday. Um, was it Thursday or Wednesday? I don't remember. So we didn't get an immediately uh, an immediate drawdown on that. So. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, definitely broke down below that support line there, but Monero tends to break down support lines and then come right back. So um, I wouldn't be too worried about that crash. Or, I mean, I say crash. What is that? Like that's it's almost nothing. That would be eight nine percent. Yeah, so that's that's nothing. Uh, okay, we go to Monero versus Bitcoin. Yeah, we also kind of broke down what was a slightly a support line here as well versus Bitcoin. Um, I guess, uh, I mean, we're basically looking at those same stinking prices that we were at relative to Bitcoin in um, at the height of the uh, uh, of the hype and the bull market and the leverage and the fraud and all that. So I do wonder to myself, like, is this a sign that these prices we're seeing in crypto aren't real again? Are, are we really like, should we really believe those prices? I don't know. There's the ETFs coming up. It would be just so special if the ETFs get approved here in the next um, week or so, 
and then and then that marks another major top right maybe that marks uh bitcoin at like let's just say uh, I mean, 47K is the resistance point, and probably that's a very prominent area for everyone to watch, to look at. So it's hard to, you know, like maybe we don't get all the way there, right? Maybe there's just too much selling here for price to actually make it to this obvious um, sort of 47K area. We definitely are in the um, the standard deviation band areas where, you know, where we talk about the potential for uh, for that topping action. Let's go to the daily. The bands come out more cleanly that way. Yeah, so these long-term blue bands, th these are the like this is the top of the standard deviation range. And again, these are just in my mind, they're sort of like silent psychological levels that people have in aggregate that they don't really know that they have. But it's kind of like a a map for seeing some of that. So, <coughs> excuse me. So um, yeah, I think that um, you know we've already kind of hit like this this lower band cluster right here. This is really would be another topping area. Mm, you know, but the ETFs get approved, you know, maybe we, we could take a big shot up to the to the top side here for a moment. But um, I, I do wonder, like, how many people are thinking about the same deal? Well, the ETFs got approved. The, the things I don't hear anyone, at least on crypto Twitter, I don't hear anyone talking about that. I don't hear anyone say, hey, by the way, guys, remember the last time the ETFs were approved? And remember when Coinbase got listed and that was the literal day of the top? And remember December 17th, 2017, when we got listed on the on the CME and that was the literal day of the top? I still don't hear hardly anyone talking about that. So. Maybe yeah, there's like, that like the oldest, like, right? Like buy the news, sell the, sell the event type of thing. Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. Like yeah. that Bitcoin is like the perfect example of that. And I guess crypto in general, but um, yeah. And I, I still don't see anyone talking about that it's being suspicious, um, you know, of, of what could happen here when the ETFs get approved. So uh, maybe there's just plenty of juice to squeeze. I, I'm assuming there has to be juice to squeeze or this pump wouldn't have happened. So. Um, I mean, it, it would also be that right the the large holders like the Michael Sailors of the world or whatever wouldn't this be a time when they'd be looking to potentially you know sell a lot of their their Bitcoin right as they try to sell it into a pump? Boy, that would be interesting if Sailor sold. I don't think he he might be able to like in the background sort of covertly take shorts against Bitcoin to protect his protect his stack. And he's he's probably big enough and smart enough to have done that, um, you know. Like in terms of micro strategy and um, macro strategy, I think there's this other company. Um, yeah, like I, I don't think he would actually unload Bitcoin itself. He wouldn't unload those bags. That would be too traumatic for the markets. Um, but he might have taken a short against against that stack to protect it. Um, oh, another thing that happened of interest: Mount Gox finally made some payments. But oh yeah, you've been talking about that forever. So that that finally happened. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's man, they, they just they seem to find every way possible to delay, delay, delay. This time mm -hmm. they made payments to people's PayPal accounts, but they made double payments. And so now everyone has to send those funds back. But not everyone's gonna send those funds back. So it, some people already withdrew the funds and deposited to their bank and spent it. They sent everybody double payments. Yeah, I'm, I don't think they sent everybody, but they sent a lot of people double payments. So now what are they going to have to do, right? Oh, well, we messed up. I'm oh, sorry. Well, well, I guess we're going. We need an extension to sort this all out. Blah blah. It's just a like you can't convince me at this moment that that wasn't intentional. They did something in the background to fuck that up so that they could delay the payments again. Mm. Uh, now you could probably just say it's a Japanese lawyer that's like, yeah, yeah, I want to keep stretching this out and getting my paycheck and my legal office and team, and we're all getting a fat, you know, a, a fat salary here on, on the basis of the Gox coin until they're finally paid. And it's actually like this is apparently something that happens um, pretty pretty commonly with trustees that are supposed to be um, distributing assets like this. So uh, I... Did you say send double payments? I was listening to the recorded stream audio. I didn't hear who, oh, who it was. Um, Gox, Mount Gox. Um, the Gox oh, trustee. yeah, that's... Yep, yep. So, yeah, I mean, now it's like, well, they're going to have to freeze all the payments and like, well, what do we do about the people that won't send the money back? And we're, we can we can claw it back from PayPal. Claw back is a legal term, but it's not the right term there. But you know what I mean? Um, you know, we can claw it back from PayPal, but then that that's bureaucracy and paperwork. And I mean, it's just how how on earth could they have screwed this up after having like literally two two years to plan it out? And that's been their whole thing. Oh, we want to make sure it's done right. You know, we I mean, their, their whole M.O. is just screwing things up, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. they were just meant to be a magical. Right? When did they start as a a trading company for like those like magic cards or whatever they are? Wasn't that? Yeah, yeah. They were like a game. I don't know, some kind of game 
end game asset trading or and they just uh, added uh, Bitcoin and like yeah got in way over their head. <laughs> yep. What happened the, to so, Mark Carpellis? So this, is he still around? Like, is he still like saying stuff? Is he on Twitter? Um, yeah, he's so like a year ago he said maybe it was a, a year and a half ago, two years ago actually. Oh, geez. Two years ago, he was like, well, we think the payments might start in September of 2022. Uh, he occasionally makes some comments. I think he's still like apprised of things in a way that's like slightly insider. Like, But I mean, he went to jail, right? He went to jail for like four years. So I guess he went to prison then. Supposedly he got pretty buff in prison, you know, didn't have anything else to do. Did he? Um, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. That is awesome. Uh, yeah, Mount Gox out. was a, uh, it was a Magic the Gathering online trading yeah. site. And that's what it stands for mount gox mt gox magic the gathering online exchange oh and it was basically a third party exchange yeah. for people to trade those cards right before bitcoin even existed yeah we were like magic 2006. Being one of those people on there that was just trading like magical uh what is it called magical are those things magic the gathering online magic the gathering I mean, imagine just being one of those people and then just kind of falling into Bitcoin from there because that, that was kind of your your way into Bitcoin. That's incredible. Magic cards, magic internet money. <laughs> right. Natural fit. But yeah, the, the, the Gox trustee now is like a Japanese lawyer that's like handling, they're supposed to be handling the the assets of Gox, the remaining assets to distribute right. them to the uh, to the victims. So like, it's definitely not even the, it's not even the like original Gox people at all. It's just like a totally different organization and it's still screwed up, so. What's the number? The, like approximately? It's like a uh, one hundred and forty thousand Bitcoin and Bitcoin yeah. Cash. Um, but yeah, wild. they tried to make the 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 fiat payments. That's what the PayPal thing was all about. I'm pretty sure it was just the the fiat payments. Uh, and then they screwed the very first thing they tried to do. They screwed up. So I don't think it was an accident. Right, I forgot. And then you have all that Bitcoin Cash there too. Which yeah, you were you were you were theorizing that you know maybe some percentage of that moves into Monero, right? Especially the Bitcoin Cash people. Right, there's, oh, there's um, overlap there between, right? Because those, those, are, those are old schoolers. Go ahead. Yeah, I was theorizing that Bitcoin that um, that a lot of the Bitcoin would move into Monero because the the Bitcoin Cash doesn't represent a significant amount of um, volume, like of of money. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I mean, there like if we just take the relative market cap, let's just say a half a percent. If a half percent of one hundred forty one thousand Bitcoin move into Monero, that's um, that's uh, about seventy thousand. Monero, uh, or really, I think I have that wrong. That would be like 300,000 Monero. Uh, well, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. 1% at 14,000. Um, nah, you know what? I'm not going to try and do public math. You're adding much sleep last night. So. 400. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, it, it represents a significant amount of money that could move into Monero, and especially in a low liquidity situation, could, um, could definitely move the price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's what's going on with Gax there. Um, I guess, you know, we don't really have too much else to talk about here. If you guys wanted to cover anything in particular, this is Bitcoin dominance. Um, so it looks like it's broken down. It's rising wedge here. This is good. You know, screw Bitcoin. Like they, there are solutions they could take. They could, they could like talk to some Monero people and be like, yeah, you know what? Why don't we, um, why don't we limit SegWit? Like, first of all, why don't we just reduce the size of SegWit from three freaking megabytes to two and then tack that other megabyte onto base transaction data? Um, why don't we limit the number of outputs? Um, or if you need to use, say, 100 outputs, you're going to have to pay a premium on those. Why don't we make it so that if you use more than the base, the, so you've got your base transaction data, which doesn't include the signature, and then about 60% of that base transaction data is going to be needed for the witness data as a signature. So like in most transactions, in most monetary-based transactions, you don't need more um, than the base transaction data. So the base transaction is like, I don't know, let's just say 150 um, bytes. So then you need something like 100 bytes of, um, of signature data. T t I mean, these are rough numbers depending on like which of the many protocols in Bitcoin you're using, but you don't need to use more than 100% of that base transaction data in witness. So why don't they make a graduated um, pricing structure so that the more data you use in witness, the higher you get charged for it. Um, like there's so many things they could do to make this problem less bad, but oh, for some reason, it seems like all the people associated with Blockstream and small blocks are so focused on how nothing can be done and you can't stop it. And none of them are saying, none of those people that put
push the small block narrative that that are that were associated with Blockstream at some point in the past that, that made this whole thing happen. They're responsible for SegWit and Taproot, by the way. None of them are saying, yeah, maybe we should reconsider the price points, stuff like that. None of them have said anything in the kinds of like mitigation strategies that Monero took. Why why not? Like it just it just pisses me off. Like they I still like as much as I talk shit about Bitcoin, I still would like to have seen it like fixed it enough for it to be used because we just like we need some we need a digital freedom money. Um, and we're gonna need multiple chains. If we maxed out Monero's capacity while remaining decentralized, like we're still gonna need other chains. Um, so I don't know, it's a freaking rant. Anyway, so I don't care if Bitcoin's it's dominance so is dropping good. <laughs> I love go ahead, man. No, 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 I I love it. Keep going. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we talked about this a few weeks ago. We said, hey, you know, I don't really have a strong opinion on what happens with this chart, but we are kind of in the moment where, um, you know, things, people are optimistic, so then shit coins like to pop off when, uh, you know, when, when when people think Bitcoin is is going to be doing good and is in a bull market, et cetera. So right now, I think the presumption is largely Bitcoin's in a bull market. All right. I'm just sitting here thinking, how exciting is this, though? Right? Like, we're, we're entering 2024. This is like max entertainment. Monero is being completely <laughs> delisted from all centralized exchanges. Um, I don't know. It makes me smile. I think it's as people it's, post JPEGs on Bitcoin. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I never thought, you know, uh, things would play out to like literally this degree uh, with regards to to Monero and Bitcoin. Like Monero is really proving itself to be the best form of digital cash. They're delisting yeah. it. For, they're, they're literally just going after Monero, Monero only. Um, if yeah, that's, I mean that's hilarious. Like how much of a like how much of a a plug that is. It's like yeah, y'all y'all are so scared that you'll have to delist it. Right. Crazy. But it, it's all privacy coins. Yeah. yeah oh, Dash, you know, Dash, especially Dash, especially Dash. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want people accessing Dash. Anyone that calls themselves a privacy coin, regardless of whether you are or not, it's like even if you just like the idea of supporting privacy is wrong, think and we'll delist you. Yeah, I think it's funny to see like the Zcash people like jumping on this, like how they're being attacked. Meanwhile, Zcash has gone out of their like literally has has made design decisions based on trying to interface with centralized exchanges. Right. Yep. yep. I mean, Monero is really the the own only crypto that has purposely gone out of its way to not not interface with centralized exchanges and not being able to to apply kyc aml on the coin in any way well zcash needs the exchanges how else are they going to sell how else is zuku going to buy stake with his 20 percent dev tax but uh, you know, one thing I learned about Bitcoin. Oh, I, too is Zuko off. I like Zuko. I've been trying to get Zuko <laughs> on this show forever. He got all pissed at me for blocked was, you, right? Yeah, he he basically was pissed at me. I was like surprised what it ended up being about. It was it was when we had Vic, I think, on here, and it was we were talking about whether or not Zcash should be added to Cake Wallet. And obviously, I, I guess I was opposed at the time, and he took it personally the way I was like describing Zcash. Mm. I've heard a lot of drama about uh, Zcash and Cake Wallet. Yeah, yeah. I know the whole story. I mean, what do you guys think about that? I don't even think I'm that. I was all that opposed. That's why I couldn't believe he was so pissed at me. I forget, like, or maybe I don't even he's a big what. blocker, man. He blocks yeah. everybody. Yeah, yeah. And so, so now he's not really part of. Like, has he moved on from Zcash or something? Is he like not really? Oh, I have, I would need to like find a way to follow him because I'm blocked. Yeah, is he, is he not developing on it anymore? I don't know. I haven't. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I'd need to check that out. Follow that. Use Knitter, and then you can view his profile. Yeah, yeah. That's actually every time I see like this, you can't see this tweet. I just go. He's kind of been quote unquote <laughs> dethroned as the CEO of Zcash and somebody else, right? I think there was. I haven't been following closely, but I think there's been internal conflict there. Like, like people didn't like the some of the decisions he was making. Hmm, interesting. Uh, I can be about that, I'm sure there's people. I mean, that might be some fun drama to get involved in, you know, for a moment. But, uh... Yeah, you know, one thing that happened with um that I, I realized with Bitcoin, so these BRC twenties, they're like ERC twenties, but for Bitcoin, apparently they issue them as like mass UTXOs. It's like they'll do a transaction and then just like 
pollute the UTXO set with shitloads of these BRC20 tokens. So and $20 then, fees isn't enough, is what you're saying? Uh, yeah, it depends on the day. <laughs> Tried to send a Bitcoin transaction a couple of days ago, and it's just like, God dang it. But uh, and then and then all the same people, all the same like maxi tards are like, oh, they're polluting the UTXO set. No shit, they are. So put a cap on the number of outputs you can have and force them to do if they want to put a thousand outputs. Well, guess what? Now they have to do a hundred transactions. Suddenly those economic price points might not make so much sense anymore. But they're like, oh, we can't do anything. It's like, well, you know what? Y'all fostered that ecosystem that says you can't change Bitcoin at all because it's already so perfect and the best money in the history of the galaxy, both past, present, and future. <laughs> it's like now you can't actually fix anything. You you shit in your own bed now sleep in it. Like congrats, like clap, you know. Good job, guys. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just like maybe I just I'm cranky because I didn't get enough sleep last night trying to fix my damn computer. <laughs> Body's done. He's he's done with it. Technology's no. not working. I love the wizards, man. They're just they're just epic troll. They like now they love Bitcoin so much, and they're using all of the same arguments against the maximalists. And it's like, you know what? Maybe if Bitcoin diminishes eventually here, maybe some other better coin could fill that vacuum. A real digital cypherpunk money. Hell yeah! I think we all know what we're talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want to ask you for your. Are you going to stick around? Or... Yeah, I'm gonna. I'll I'll have you guys. I'll be listening. Um, all right, because yeah, and, uh, I, I want to ask you straight up your predictions for 2024 to put a number on it. I, I know you probably don't want to, but it'll be fun. Like, uh, oh. like what, what you're predicting, uh, the high could be, the low, but we we could do that all together. Okay. Yeah. Yours. Good. That, that gives me some time to formulate my whatever wrong predictions yeah. I'll be making. <laughs> <laughs> all right, buddy. Cool. Anything else oh. you want to uh, bring up? No, no, I mean, you know, I could talk forever about price. There's like other stuff we could look at, but uh, Ethereum BTC is still holding in this like big ass triangle here, you know. Um, I still, uh, you know, we'll, we'll wait. For, we'll we'll wait till we get to the predictions point. Yeah. All right. Let's do that. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. All right, buddy. Happy New Year's. Thank you so much, thanks man. So much, buddy. Happy thank you New for Year's. everything you uh, did for us this year, too, man. Big, big thank you to Body. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. I really really appreciate you giving me an opportunity and a place to uh, share my thoughts. Of course, man.